Tonight we're talking about friendship and failure, and I appreciate you being here with uh, me throughout this week as we've been talking about the struggle. And if you haven't um, seen it yet or realized, I've been struggling. Um, so pardon me if I got on some soapboxes this week. And um, I ask that you pray for me, especially tonight, because this message really convicted my heart and touched me in a very special way. And I pray the same for you. Do you mind kneeling with me as we pray together? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you as, as we are nothing, a speck of dust. But we're just so grateful that we can come to you, a God who is everything, and a God who does everything in, in order for us to have this opportunity to speak with you. We know that sin is that thing which separates us from you and we're grateful for the blood of Jesus, which bridges, which bridges the gap, so that we may have an opportunity to be reconnected with our Father. Tonight, we pray that you speak to us, that you encourage us, but also that you warn us. As we now submit to you, we pray you take full control. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a, a picture on the screen of a young man by the name of um, oh, I, actually, before my picture on the screen, just kind of want to give you a sort of a, a picture of where we've been, uh, where we've come from this week. So we talked about um, our wait. What's going on here? Oh, there you go. All right. Um, you can't see what I'm seeing, but I'm looking at a blank picture at the back. Um, so I didn't realize this was up here. So this is kind of uh, where we've been going this week. We talked about the importance of watching our attitude when we go through situations. And yes, the world is difficult right now, but we need to have an attitude of gratitude as we relate to God and what he's doing in our lives. Then we talked about, where did they go? Right? Uh, you know what we talked about this week. <laughs> We're just going to move on. <laughs> Technology is not cooperating here tonight uh, with me. So we're just going to move on. I have a picture on the screen of a young man by the name of Kyle McDonald. Um, Kyle is a very interesting character. In fact, he inspires me. Uh, he uh, actually went viral in the year 2005, between 2005, 2006, early 2006, because of his ability to trade things. And Kyle McDonald is known as the guy, uh, another way he's described, he's the red paperclip guy. Don't, even, don't know if you've ever heard his story, but Kyle went from trading a red paperclip all the way up to a house. Okay? So Kyle, this is a picture of his red paperclip. Just imagine that, trading his way from a red paperclip all the way up to a house. I wish I had the skill to do that. Right? Back in 2000, uh, 2005, Kyle started his first trade. He went from a red paper clip, um, and what he did, the reason why he went viral was that he had, a, um, he had a blog, and he had people tracking his trades as he would make them, and he would travel from different, different parts of the U.S. and also in areas of Canada, and he would uh, allow people to see what he was trading as he was going on on this journey. So he traded his paper clip, and from there he went to a pen, so a paper clip to a pen, and then from a pen to a doorknob, and then a doorknob to a camp stove, then he traded in the camp stove, and then he got himself a snowmobile. Just imagine, a camp stove to a snowmobile, and then after that, with, obviously with a couple of things there in between, he traded in his, the snowmobile he had for a recording contract, and then he traded his recording contract for um, a truck, a box truck. I mean, this is fascinating. Going from a paperclip all the way up to a truck. And then eventually he traded that in and he got a movie deal, traded in his movie deal and got uh, rent free for a whole year. And then traded in his rent free for a whole year. I think he got something else there. And then eventually he traded in for a house. 
This is his house, a farmhouse. Kind of looks like mine. <laughs> he traded in. So he went from a paper clip all the way up to a house. Don't know how he did it, but he became famous as a result of it. He still has a website today, and he goes to places and he does talks about the fact that he, uh, uh, how he did it. And uh, I think one news uh, reporter asked him, how did you do it? To this day, he still doesn't know how. But anyway, it happened. So he has a house. Um, and now this house is called the Red Paperclip House. It has actually a, a red paperclip on the front lawn. And you can see the red trims around the window. So Kyle went from a paperclip all the way up to a house. Trading. Most of us are not as successful in our trading. I remember when I was a child, um, years ago, I remember I, the first time I was disappointed by a trade that I made. My grandmom, she had bought me a, a remote control um, Batmobile. This is, a, this is this really nice, I love the thing. I mean, you just put batteries in and you just had the antenna on it and it goes really fast. And as a kid, I enjoyed having that toy. And there was another um, boy in town and he really liked my Batmobile. He wanted it. And he was much older than I was and I didn't realize that didn't realize um, that what he was trading me, uh, trading for my Batmobile was not worth anything at all. He ripped me off. To this day, I'm still upset. Pray for me now. Because I love my Batmobile, okay? Uh, just imagine Pastor Jermaine playing with a Batmobile. Um, but, but, but he traded my, he came and he said, hey, you know, let's make a deal. I'll give you a bag of bricks. Plastic bricks, these plastic stackable things for your Batmobile. And as a kid, I'm thinking, well, it's more than one. <laughs> I just had one Batmobile. He has a bag of plastic bricks. So I traded my Batmobile for a bag of plastic bricks. And days later, I realized how horrible the trade was. And I went to him and told him, hey, I want my car back. And he said, you already made a deal. You're not getting your car back and don't come back. He was much bigger than I was, so I wasn't going to mess around. I, was always, I grew up as a tiny kid, and so I knew I was going to get a beat down. So I'm like, I cried on my way home because I realized I lost my Batmobile to a very bad trade. I still remember it. You can tell how painful that is. Right? But I remember that as a child because, I, I, again, I felt ripped off. Uh, no one likes to feel ripped off in life. Okay, anyone here enjoys feeling ripped off? Right? But in life, we, we make a lot of trades. There are times when you have to kind of trade things out when, when it comes to life decisions. I remember when we were looking for houses, Allie and I, we drove to this house over in St. John's, and we were having a conversation about what we were willing to trade in order to get into a house. All the way in St. John's, it was quite far, and we were looking for property, and that was the fundamental thing we had agreed on. And so we're like, okay, even if it means we may have to sacrifice some driving time, let's try to get the house with property. And so we went all the way to St. John's, and we started rationalizing the trade. We started thinking, well, it's going to add a little bit more to the driving time. And so my way of rationalizing through that process was to say, well, look, I could listen to a lot of audiobooks, even if it means we're a little bit further away. But obviously, being further away does include some inconveniences. But nonetheless, uh, praise God we didn't make that trade. We didn't buy that house. We bought one much closer to our workplaces, and God provided that. So I'm happy we didn't make that decision at that time. Years ago, I met a, a young man. Um, we had a very tough conversation. It had a really strong impression on me because of where his mind was. He was traveling through town. He was more of a free spirit kind of guy. He was going from state to state, and he ended up in Michigan for some reason. And we had, I think we had lunch or something together, and we were talking, and in the conversation, he got to a place of hopelessness, and he was telling me how much he was struggling, and what he was struggling with was this mindset. He, for some reason, thought that he was Judas. He said, I feel like I'm Judas when it comes to God. I betrayed Jesus, and there's no hope for me. So I, sp I spent the entire time trying to convince him that he is not Judas, and there's hope for him. And... I was not successful. 
But it had a strong impression on me because I remember when he left that conversation, he was going to hitchhike to somewhere else. I don't know where he ended up, but I remember the thought that he conveyed. He said, I am Judas, and I've, I've, I've wasted my life away in Jesus. I've traded it all, and there's no hope for me. It had a really, really, really strong impression on me. And for a couple of days, I remember praying, but I felt really bad. Because I was trying my very best to help him to see that there was hope and that God loves him and he could save him still. But he just, just didn't get it. Judas is a challenging story. Because you know of Judas that he made a trade too. And it was a horrible trade that he made. 30 pieces of silver for the Messiah. Unlike Kyle, who traded from a paperclip all the way up to a house, Judas traded for 30 pieces of silver and gave up on eternal life. And that's a horrible trade to make. And this story has impressions, has an impression on many people. I mentioned that one young man that I met and spoke to. There was another group of young people that I spoke to, and Judas also came up in the conversation they thought about. They were trying to analyze and trying to understand why is it that Judas went this way, and they also felt that God had directed his path and that he was predestined to make that choice. Judas, bad tradesman. There's a lot of trading in all of our relationships. We go back and forth. We trade things all the time. But talking about Judas, I want you to see something that the Lord brought to my mind in his, with his story that I never thought about before. This is failure to the greatest degree, the failure of a friend, a friend of the Savior. It is friendship with its greatest test. But how did this kind of failure happen is the question that I had to ask as I looked at Judas's life. Judas... Whenever his name is mentioned, he's mentioned as one of the 12. And you know, Judas was one of the disciples. Over and over again, we see the words in Scripture, one of the 12 repeated where Judas's name is concerned or Judas's name is mentioned. There was a decisive moment in the ministry of Jesus that we need to pay attention to that highlights some of Judas's struggle. And that moment comes to us here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is right after Jesus had worked a miracle and fed the multitude, and Jesus was having a conversation with the people about their choices. They had come to him simply because they wanted some bread, some more bread. Jesus was the bread maker, and so they saw nothing as nothing more than just a bread maker. Jesus, can you make some more of that bread? And Jesus says, I don't have any more bread to give you. What I have to give you is the bread which came down from heaven, meaning me. And the Bible says there that many people were offended at his saying, and many turned away from him. But in that moment, there is something that is highlighted. Um, this is our, our key text. We're going to come back to this. In that moment, in John chapter 6, verse 64, Jesus made a statement there that I really believe was intentionally pointed at Judas. Jesus said there, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew, John says, from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who, would, and who would betray him, specifically pointing out Judas. These words spoken by Jesus were specifically, as I said before, geared towards Judas, who had, who had uh, attached himself to the ministry of Christ, but at the same time didn't really believe in the ministry of Christ that he was attached to. Judas started out as a skeptic and ended his ministry or a time with Jesus as a skeptic. Jesus was giving people, and I love this about Jesus, that he gives us the opportunity. He opens the door and says, hey, you can come with me if you want to, but here's the door. You can also exit if you choose. And this was one of those moments. He was giving people an opportunity to choose. Do I choose Jesus or do I choose to go another way? Some people made the choice to not go with Jesus. The Bible tells us that in John 6 and verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and did what? Walked with him no more. They took the exit. They walked out. They turned away. They're like, you know, we're not going to go any further with this thing. But not Judas. Judas stuck around. 
Judas, I believe, was really struggling. And he was struggling with balancing um, many things. But one thing in particular, I believe, I'm going to highlight tonight. But I love this about God. That he's the type of God who always provides an opportunity for us to choose. To choose him or to choose otherwise. He is not afraid of making truth abundantly clear and then says, here is where we are going. You have a choice to make. Come with me or turn away. The problem with Laodicea is that we are not good at choosing. We like staying in the middle, lukewarm, not hot or cold. There are countless signs, by the way, up to this point that Jesus himself performed And the disciples were convinced based on the evidences that Jesus had demonstrated that he was the Messiah. In John chapter 6, we find evidence of this in verse 67. For the Bible says there, then Jesus said to the, uh, when he said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Notice the question. The others turned away. Jesus focuses in on his disciples and is saying, do you also want to take the door? How did the disciples respond? Specifically, Peter. Peter is the good spokesperson for every friend. You need a Peter in every friend group. Because he's the type of guy who would say what you're thinking but afraid to say. Everyone needs someone like that. Come on, you know. We need someone like that. Sometimes you're sitting down, you have a thought, and you're like, man, should I actually say? Because I don't want to seem... And then Peter, yep, that's exactly it. Thank you. So Peter speaks. Peter responds. Um, Let's turn to John chapter 6. I don't know what's going on today with my, my, uh, my setup here. So John chapter 6. It's good to have the text on the screen, but even better to look at it in our Bible. So John chapter 6, Jesus asked the question, do you also want to go away? And then Peter responds in verse 68. Peter responds with a question. I love this. It shows the humility of Peter. And in this culture, in this society, again, the, the, this, uh, this, the, he wants to make sure that Jesus understands that he's not trying to challenge him, but rather respond in the affirmative. So he's asking a question, Lord, to whom shall we go? Legitimate question. You have the words of eternal life. And then verse 69, he confirms what Jesus had done for them. Also, we have come to believe, up to this point, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus was confirmed as the Messiah among his disciples. And then Jesus does this. Again, I believe, focusing in on Judas. Jesus answered them. Peter spoke up in confidence And this is the interesting thing about us. We always assume the best of, well, we sometimes assume the best of people. Okay? They're all in the same group. They're all among the 12. So Peter, his his mindset is, since we're all here together, it is true, we're all here with you, Jesus. Jesus responds. um, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you, is a devil. Just imagine being there and hearing those words falling on the ears of the disciples. Wait, we're 12, but one of us is a devil? Isn't that kind of harsh? I mean, that's a very honest reflection. But coming not from a, a, a friend, because, I mean, it's, it's, you think about it, it's offensive for someone to call you, use that term, Relating to you. But when God uses it, you know he knows what's going on. So Jesus, one of you, is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the twelve. So again, over and over again, in in the scriptures, we find Judas always mentioned, even though his name is there, and that term is there, who would betray, there's always that term, one of the twelve. Always repeated. We talked about the fact that last night, um, when we talked about Peter, that Jesus called Peter. Well, he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now he's saying to Judas, 
you're a devil. I always thought that both meant the same. But Jesus was highlighting a certain aspect of Judas's character that I think is very important for us to talk about. Jesus could have said, get behind me, Satan. But it didn't really connect in this sense with Judas's character. It connected more with Peter's character. Because Peter, for his, throughout his entire life, he would struggle with this one problem. He was always in the way of other people. Peter would be a stumbling block to people. He became a stumbling block to Jesus when he was trying to fulfill the will of God. You think in the book of Galatians, Paul had to confront Peter to his face because he became a stumbling block to the Gentiles. That was Peter's struggle, a stumbling block. So Jesus rightly identify, identify the fact that Satan's struggle with Peter here was that he was always putting him in this situation where Peter would become a stumbling block for other people. But Judas, what was his problem? Satan here, when, when identified, very specific. Uh, devil here, I should say, very specific. Jesus is pointing out one character flaw of Judas that I think is very, very important. That is, Judas was one who accused others. That was his constant struggle. All throughout his experience with Jesus, Judas often made his character look a little bit better than those who were around him. In other words, Judas babied his sins and condemned other people. The accuser of the brethren. And Jesus saying this was to point out the struggle that Judas was having. This one stronghold, this one thing that Satan had against the guy. And Jesus was saying, one of you has an issue. He was pointing out this problem. Now, now all of them had issues, mind you. But in this one sense, this was a dangerous territory for Judas to continue on. And so Jesus was trying to get him to see, Satan really wants you. But please don't allow him to take you this way. And so this was the beginning of Judas' struggle. He was going to have an intense battle with Satan over this issue. Jesus, by the way, was giving Judas some hope. Because Jesus, Jesus used the words, did I not choose 12? He didn't say, did I not choose 11? And one of you is a devil. Meaning Je Jesus was saying, Judas, I have not excluded you from my decisions. I chose you even though you have a weakness. I chose you even though you have a flaw. It just shows the commitment of God to us even with our flawed characters. And I just love him for that. That he would choose me, like the Apostle Paul says, the chief of all sinners. Man, where would we be without Jesus? He chose 12, one of them, in this sense, as he highlights Judas' flaw, had to battle with Satan over this issue. So the nuance in the text, with Peter being a stumbling block, and isn't that what the church is sometimes? There are people who are stumbling blocks to other people. And there are others who accuse others. Two weaknesses needed to be overcome. Two character flaws that needed to be resolved. Two individuals struggling, struggling with Satan. And Jesus was trying to very, his very best to work with these individuals, to work these things out of their characters. They were both among the 12, but both flawed. Peter would later deny Jesus, being a stumbling block. Judas would betray Jesus, being an accuser. For in his betrayal, he was simply saying Jesus is nothing more than an imposter, which was the same idea that was conveyed by the leaders in Jerusalem. In Peter, we see a hypocrite. In Judas, we see a backbiter or backstabber. And that which made the difference is how we respond to Jesus when he calls us out. There's a Judas and a Peter in every church, a Judas and a Peter in every school, a Judas and a Peter in every home, in every workplace, and in every social gathering. There are Judases and Peters in every small group, 
in every church function. There are Judases and Peters in every ministry function. Judas and Peter, they can be well, talented, gifted people. Speak well, preach well, pray well, sing well, and the list goes on and on. But again, we all have character flaws. And I love Jesus because he doesn't leave or forsake us with those flaws. He pleads with us all throughout that journey with him. And that's what Jesus was trying to do for Judas. This is why you and I must be very careful with the type of course we take in life. For the characters we have cannot be trusted for a millisecond. We have to allow Jesus to change our characters. Because there are times when we go from being a Peter, a stumbling block, to a Judas. I have one moment in my life, personally, that I remember vividly to this day. My aunt had done something. And in my home circle in, in Jamaica, um, you know that phrase, it takes a community to raise a child? We took that seriously in Jamaica, OK? And growing up, if I did something wrong on the street, even without cell phones, my dad would know before I get home. I don't know how that worked out, OK? And sometimes, if I had a relative that saw me doing something wrong, they would give me a whooping. And then I would go home and complain to my dad, and my dad would do the same. Life was unfair, OK? <laughs> In other words. But I remember one time my aunt had disciplined me for something I did. And I was at home. Someone else was there. And I remember sitting in the room telling this person everything horrible I knew about my aunt. And my aunt was by the door listening to every word I said. And then I remember, man, I feel terrible just thinking about this. Man, praise God that he forgives us of our sins. But I remember my aunt, she walked gently through the door and cleared her throat. <clears throat> and I looked around and saw my aunt. And my next decision, I had two options, fight or flight. But if you already got a whooping from your aunt, you're not going to choose fight. So I opened the back door, and I ran. I ran weeping. <laughs> because <laughs> God have mercy on us. That was my way of taking revenge on my aunt to spread rumors about her. And that was the path of Judas. Because Judas would continue to choose this path. I'll show you an example. If you'll turn me in your Bibles to John chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And we always want, as I said before, we always want some sympathy. And sometimes we trade sympathy for information. I'll tell you the dirt I have on so-and-so if you just sympathize with me because they did me wrong. So we get into gossip, slander, accusations, simply because we just don't like someone or we want to take revenge because they did something to us. The path of Judas. John 12 tells us that Judas did something extremely horrible. And I didn't notice this before, what Judas was doing, but I'm going to bring it to your, to your attention. Jesus, this was the Last Supper. Just imagine this. This was a communion service. <laughs> Judas was there. Um, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Again, another evidence of Jesus' divinity. They, uh, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary, 
took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Mary is making a trade. She's saying, that which I have, that's most expensive, is worth nothing compared to Jesus. So she was willing to trade that in, a year's wage, just to simply have a moment to anoint Jesus for his burial. She is thinking eternally. Judas, on the other hand, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him again, those words show up, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to who? What does the Bible say next? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put into it. Just imagine that. Judas was willing to tarnish the reputation of this woman just so that he could have some extra cash. He was willing to trade her reputation in just for some extra money. That's how he lived. The disciples knew it. John boldly proclaims it. It's almost common knowledge that Judas would help himself to the money bag. When I read this in Desire of Ages, I cried because it finally dawned on me that Judas was trying to ruin this woman while making himself look good. She says, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, but one of his disciples, Jesus, carried Simon. Oh, that's the text. Ah. Ah. Do you see that? Okay. All right. Now we're at the quote. Judas had a high opinion of his own executive ability. He had what? A high opinion of his own executive ability. So Judas focused in on his talents. As a financier, he thought himself greatly superior to his fellow disciples. And he had led them to regard him in the same light. He had gained their confidence and had a strong influence over them. How would he use his influence? His professed sympathy for the poor deceived them. And his artful insinuation caused them to look distrustfully upon Mary's devotion. In other words, this act has something sinister behind it. Don't trust this woman. Judas, when Mary heard these words, this is the, just to imagine the response of Mary. If you were there and you took your best, your everything, and poured it, and then someone criticizes you for that, and, and then insinuate that you have no care at all for those who need help, how would you respond? How would you feel? When Mary heard these words of criticism, her heart trembled within her. And this is the part that made me cry. She feared that her sister would reproach her for the extravagance. The master, too, might think her improvident, not caring about the poor. wasteful. So she thought there was this, this was a horrible mistake I made. I should not have brought my expensive ointment and poured it on the feet of Jesus because obviously this is not approved. Uh, this is quite wrong. But then Jesus did this. Jesus looked at Judas. The look that which Jesus cast upon Judas convinced him that the Savior penetrated his hypocrisy and read his base, contemptible character. Once more, Jesus reveals to Judas the path he was going on. I believe with all of my heart, friends, that Jesus really wanted to save Judas. If only he responded. And in commending Mary's action, which had been so severely, what's the next word? 
condemned? What's in her action? What did she do to deserve condemnation? Christ had rebuked Judas, and that was it. For Judas, that was the last straw. We read, now the reproof rankled his heart. Judas's pride stood up firm. He determined to be revenged. From supper, he went directly to the palace of the high priest, where he found the council assembled and offered to betray Jesus into their hands. And this is not written there, but you know, for 30 pieces of silver. Mary used a year's wage. 30 pieces of silver is not even a month's wage. Judas was willing to trade Jesus in for less than a month's salary. Mary was willing to give a year's salary to make sure that Jesus was comfortable for his burial. See the opposite. There are two tradesmen here, trade man, trade woman, in this sense. She was willing to give everything to have one moment with Jesus. Judas would give everything to take revenge against Jesus. How are you living, friends? How are you functioning? Are you living your entire life to take revenge on someone else who has hurt you? Willing to spend everything, every waking hour, to ensure that they get paid for what they did. There's a man by the name of Louis Zamberini. His book, really good book, was actually recommended to me by Israel. And that book changed my life. It's called Unbroken, about uh, a young man who was going to run. He was actually on the verge, actually did run the world's fastest mile, I think, as a marathon runner. And he, was, he had uh, gone to the Olympics. He didn't run his fastest mile then, but eventually there was a war, and he was enlisted in that war. And... As a result of that, he wasn't able to, to run his fastest mile in the Olympics. But anyway, during one of his training events as a soldier, he ran the fastest mile. So he felt he was ready for the Olympics if, if it ever came back around. But Louis Zam, Zam, uh, Zamperini was flying. Um, I forgot what ocean it was. And his plane crashed. He and his crew were on the ocean, um, stranded there for a while. And eventually they got rescued, but by the wrong side of the war. They got rescued by the enemies. And there was one, his experience throughout the war, I mean, just a, just a list of unfortunate circumstances, one after the other. And as he was a prisoner of war, there was one guy that tortured him all, all the way through. And it turned out that he, the guy knew that Louis was uh, Olympic, an Olympic runner. Finally, when Louis was rescued, when he escaped, he came back to the States. And for many, many, many months, it might be many years, there was one thing he lived for, to pay that guy back. Every single day, he thought of that guy who tortured him. Every single waking moment, he thought of that guy who tortured him. As a result of that, he got into alcohol, um, drugs, and some other stuff. And eventually, God found him. He went to, uh, I think it was a Billy Graham crusade once and gave his testimony. You may find it online as well. But anyway, the book is better. God rescued the man from the life he was living because that one thing was on his mind constantly was to take revenge on someone else. I'm going to tell you right now, friends, that sometimes as church people, we live for that one thing too, to take revenge on someone else who has hurt us. But friends, that's the path of Judas. That's what Judas did. That's the path he chose. So you're like, someone hurt me. I'm going to spend everything I have. I'm going to trade in everything I have to ensure that they get paid back for what they did to me. That's not a good trade. It's a bad trade. Because in the end, you suffer. In the end, you lose. 
So how should we live then? Because when you think about it, this act of Judas is one of the worst acts of betrayal. And I just imagine the feeling in Jesus' heart that night when Judas walked into, into Gethsemane, came up close, his breath by the face of the Savior, kissed him. And Jesus would ask that dreaded question, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? I always wondered why Jesus used those words. What Jesus was trying to do in that moment was to help Judas to think because there was still hope for him. He used the word son of man to highlight the fact that the son of man in Daniel 7 was going to judge the world. Judas, are you willing to play this game? Are you going to go through with this? But Judas did. Eventually, he realized it was a terrible trade. Came back through the money in the temple. So depressed, he went and hung himself. One of the saddest stories in scripture. Extremely sad. But it shows what happens when we allow that one thing in our character to remain that Jesus is trying to remove. So Judas, the accuser of the brethren, got to the point where he saw himself or who he was, and it was unbearable. I love what Benjamin Franklin once said. I will speak ill of no man, but instead I will speak the good of every man I know. And we should live by that. Speak ill of no man. Judas babied his sins and accused others of theirs, and the, in the end could not endure the rebuke of Jesus. This rebuke became his excuse to seek revenge and turned into a friend who would commit a massive failure. When you read the story of Judas, the message is clear. Be careful. Like the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 through 14, take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But then Paul adds, instead of accusing, instead of gossiping, instead of talking evil about each other, he says, exhort one another daily, exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, meaning probation, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and sin is indeed deceitful. For we have become partners. Notice the word he used, partners, together. We are together in this thing. Partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm unto the end. We're all partners in Christ. And so, as we travel this road together, the lesson, as we struggle, let's remember to encourage one another. Can't do it by ourselves. We need the encouragement of our friends. So, if you've ever been betrayed, you know the intense feeling that comes with that. But don't get into the mindset of seeking retribution. Allow God to do his work. And I love the fact that Jesus, even though he could have snapped a finger and wiped Judas off the face of the earth, he only had one question for him. Are you willing to go through with this? He committed himself to a God who knows how to deal with the failure of friends. Jesus wanted to help a friend who was failing. Jesus wanted us to know in his experience that he knows the depths of betrayal. And so he went through with it. He would never trade such an experience and risk not being able to have compassion and sympathize with us when we experience those things. The choice of Jesus says to us that we cannot disqualify men or women based on our suspicions because he still chose Judas, even though Judas had this flaw. 
We run the risk of being betrayed by talented, qualified, good speakers, brilliant minds, but evil. But Jesus submitted himself to this process because he wanted you and I to know that the failure of friends must be placed in the hand of a God who never fails. So friends, take the warning. Don't adopt the mentality of Judas. Don't accuse anyone. Don't speak evil of anyone. But rather, as we see the day fastly approaching, let us encourage one another. Let us exhort one another and strengthen one another. If you see a brother who is struggling, provide some hope and encouragement. Because in the end, we're all partners. And by God's grace, I don't want to see any one of you not being in heaven with me. And so I solicit your prayers. I shared that story with my aunt. I remember I apologized to her and how much that really hurt her. She was crying too. And that had an intense mark on me. And so today, <laughs> I did say it a long time ago, decided I commit again to doing the same, not to speak ill of any man. Are you willing to pray with me as we make that commitment? Ask the Lord to work those things out of our characters. Let's kneel together and pray. Father in heaven, we cannot even understand how hurt you were when Judas kissed you. Sometimes we experience these things in our own lives in a very small way, but the magnitude of your betrayal is much larger. We know as we look at this story that you tried your very best. And we know that it hurts your heart that this thing still remains, not just in Judas of long time ago, but in us today. We know who the accuser of the brethren is, the devil himself, Satan who was thrown out of heaven. Father, we don't want to join his camp. We don't want to commit his sin. But rather, we want to remain in the pure light of your presence that purifies our hearts and cleans our souls. Father, we pray that as our hearts are purified, that our speech may also be pure. That when we speak, that our words be encouraging and that we may turn people heavenward and not the opposite direction. We ask you, Father, that as you continue to pour your spirit upon us, that we may experience the weight of what you want us to experience, that the message, when it comes, that we may accept and turn around and follow you. Help us not to harden our hearts, but help us to trust that you know best. And we pray that as we place our hand in your hand, and as we walk with you along these treacherous roads that we have to walk in life, that we may constantly keep a song in our hearts and that we may think of you and what you went through. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.